An electrical telegraph is a telegraph that uses electrical signals, usually conveyed via dedicated telecommunication circuit or radio. The electrical telegraph, or more commonly just telegraph, superseded optical semaphore telegraph systems, thus becoming the first form of electrical telecommunications. In a matter of decades after their creation in the 1830s, electrical telegraph networks permitted people and commerce to transmit messages across both continents and oceans almost instantly, with widespread social and economic impacts. History Early work From early studies of electricity, electrical phenomena were known to travel with great speed, and many experimenters worked on the application of electricity to communications at a distance. All the known effects of electricity, such as sparks, electrostatic attraction, chemical changes, electric shocks, and later electromagnetism, were applied to the problems of detecting controlled transmissions of electricity at various distances. In 1753, an anonymous writer in the Scots magazine suggested an electrostatic telegraph. Using one wire for each letter of the alphabet, a message could be transmitted by connecting the wire terminals in turn to an electrostatic machine, and observing the deflection of pith balls at the far end. Telegraphs employing electrostatic attraction were the basis of early experiments in electrical telegraphy in Europe, but were abandoned as being impractical and were never developed into a useful communication system. In 1774, Georges Louis Le Sage realized an early electric telegraph. The telegraph had a separate wire for each of the 26 letters of the alphabet and its range was only between two rooms of his home. In 1800, Alessandro Volta invented the voltaic pile, allowing for a continuous current of electricity for experimentation. This became a source of a low voltage current that could be used to produce more distinct effects, and which was far less limited than the momentary discharge of an electrostatic machine, which with Leiden jars were the only previously known man-made sources of electricity. Another very early experiment in electrical telegraphy was an electrochemical telegraph, created by the German physician, anatomist and inventor Samuel Thomas von Summering in 1809, based on an earlier, less robust design of 1804 by Spanish polymath and scientist Francisco Salva Campillo. Both their designs employed multiple wires up to 35 to represent almost all Latin letters and numerals. Thus, messages could be conveyed electrically up to a few kilometers in von Summering's design, with each of the telegraph receiver's wires immersed in a separate glass tube of acid. An electric current was sequentially applied by the sender through the various wires representing each digit of a message. At the recipient's end, the currents electrolyzed the acid in the tubes in sequence, releasing streams of hydrogen bubbles next to each associated letter or numeral. The telegraph receiver's operator would watch the bubbles and could then record the transmitted message. This is in contrast to later telegraphs that used a single wire with ground return. Hans Christian Ørsted discovered in 1820 that an electric current produces a magnetic field which will deflect a compass needle. In the same year Johann Schweiger invented the galvanometer, with a coil of wire around a compass, which could be used as a sensitive indicator for an electric current. 
In 1821, André Marie Ampère suggested that telegraphy could be done by a system of galvanometers, with one wire per galvanometer to indicate each letter, and said he had experimented successfully with such a system. In 1824, Peter Barlow said that such a system only worked to a distance of about 200 feet, 61 meters, and so was impractical. In 1825, William Sturgeon invented the electromagnet with a single winding of uninsulated wire on a piece of varnished iron, which increased the magnetic force produced by electric current. Joseph Henry improved it in 1828 by placing several windings of insulated wire around the bar, creating a much more powerful electromagnet which could operate a telegraph through the high resistance of long telegraph wires. During his tenure at the Albany Academy from 1826 to 1832, Henry first demonstrated the theory of the magnetic telegraph by ringing a bell through a mile, 1.6 kilometers of wire strung around the room. In 1835, Joseph Henry and Edward Davy invented the critical electrical relay. Davy's relay used a magnetic needle which dipped into a mercury contact when an electric current passed through the surrounding coil. This allowed a weak current to switch a larger current to operate a powerful local electromagnet over very long distances. Davy demonstrated his telegraph system in Regent's Park in 1837 and was granted a patent on 4 July 1838. He also developed an electric relay. <laughs> First working systems The first working telegraph was built by the English inventor Francis Ronalds in 1816 and used static electricity. At the family home on Hammersmith Mall, he set up a complete subterranean system in a 175-yard long trench as well as an 8-mile long overhead telegraph. The lines were connected at both ends to revolving dials marked with the letters of the alphabet and electrical impulses sent along the wire were used to transmit messages. Offering his invention to the Admiralty in July 1816, it was rejected as wholly unnecessary. His account of the scheme and the possibilities of rapid global communication in descriptions of an electrical telegraph and of some other electrical apparatus was the first published work on electric telegraphy and even described the risk of signal retardation due to induction. Elements of Ronald's design were utilized in the subsequent commercialization of the telegraph over 20 years later. The telegraph invented by Baron Schilling von Canstadt in 1832 had a transmitting device which consisted of a keyboard with 16 black and white keys. These served for switching the electric current. The receiving instrument consisted of six galvanometers with magnetic needles, suspended from silk threads. Both stations of Schilling's telegraph were connected by eight wires, six were connected with the galvanometers, one served for the return current and one for a signal bell. When at the starting station the operator pressed a key, the corresponding pointer was deflected at the receiving station. Different positions of black and white flags on different discs gave combinations which corresponded to the letters or numbers. Pavel Schilling subsequently improved its apparatus. He reduced the number of connecting wires from 8 to 2. On 21 October 1832, Schilling managed a short-distance transmission of signals between two telegraphs in different rooms of his apartment. In 1836, the British government attempted to buy the design but Schilling instead accepted overtures from Nicholas I of Russia. 
Schilling's telegraph was tested on a 5 km long miles experimental underground and underwater cable, laid around the building of the main Admiralty in St. Petersburg and was approved for a telegraph between the Imperial Palace at Peterhof and the naval base at Kronstadt. However, the project was cancelled following Schilling's death in 1837. Schilling was also one of the first to put into practice the idea of the binary system of signal transmission. In 1833, Carl Friedrich Gauss, together with the physics professor Wilhelm Weber in Göttingen installed a 1,200-metre-long wire above the town's roofs. Gauss combined the Pagendorf Schweiger multiplicator with his magnetometer to build a more sensitive device, the galvanometer. To change the direction of the electric current, he constructed a commutator of his own. As a result, he was able to make the distant needle move in the direction set by the commutator on the other end of the line. At first, Gauss and Weber used the telegraph to coordinate time, but soon they developed other signals, finally, their own alphabet. The alphabet was encoded in a binary code which was transmitted by positive or negative voltage pulses which were generated by means of moving an induction coil up and down over a permanent magnet and connecting the coil with the transmission wires by means of the commutator. The page of Gauss laboratory notebook containing both his code and the first message transmitted, as well as a replica of the telegraph made in the 1850s under the instructions of Weber are kept in the Faculty of Physics at the University of Göttingen, in Germany. Gauss was convinced that this communication would be a help to his kingdom's towns. Later in the same year, instead of a voltaic pile, Gauss used an induction pulse, enabling him to transmit seven letters a minute instead of two. The inventors and university were too poor to develop the telegraph on their own, but they received funding from Alexander von Humboldt. Carl August Steinheil in Munich was able to build a telegraph network within the city in 1835–6. He installed a telegraph line along the first German railroad in 1835. The Cook and Wheatstone Telegraph, was co-developed by William Fothergill Cook and Charles Wheatstone. In May 1837 they patented a telegraph system which used a number of needles on a board that could be moved to point to letters of the alphabet. Any number of needles could be used, depending on the number of characters it was required to code. The patent recommended five needles. Samuel Morse independently developed and patented a recording electric telegraph in 1837. Morse's assistant Alfred Vail developed an instrument that was called the register for recording the received messages. It embossed dots and dashes on a moving paper tape by a stylus which was operated by an electromagnet. Morse and Vail developed the Morse code signaling alphabet. The first telegram in the United States was sent by Morse on the 11th of January 1838 across 2 miles, 3 kilometers of wire at Speedwell Ironworks near Morristown, New Jersey, although it was only later in 1844 that he sent the message. What hath God wrought? Over the 44 miles 71 kilometers from the capital in Washington to the old Mount Clare Depot in Baltimore. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Commercial telegraphy. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Cook and Wheatstone system. 
The first commercial electrical telegraph, was the Cook and Wheatstone Telegraph. A demonstration four-needle system was installed on the Euston to Camden Town section of Robert Stevenson's London and Birmingham Railway in 1837 for signalling rope hauling of locomotives. It was rejected in favour of pneumatic whistles. Cook and Wheatstone had their first commercial success with a system installed on the Great Western Railway over the 13 miles 21 km from Paddington Station to West Drayton in 1838. This was a five-needle, six-wire system. This system suffered from failing insulation on the underground cables. When the line was extended to Slough in 1843, the telegraph was converted to a one-needle, two-wire system with uninsulated wires on poles. The one-needle telegraph proved highly successful on British railways, and 15,000 sets were still in use at the end of the 19th century. Some remained in service in the 1930s. The Electric Telegraph Company, the world's first public telegraphy company was formed in 1845 by financier John Lewis Ricardo and Cook. <laughs> Morse system In the United States, the Morse – Vale Telegraph was quickly deployed in the two decades following the first demonstration. The Overland Telegraph connected the west coast of the continent to the east coast by 24 October 1861. Bringing an end to the Pony Express. In 1851, a conference in Vienna of countries in the German Austrian Telegraph Union, which included many Central European countries, adopted the Morse telegraph as the system for international communications. The code adopted was considerably modified from the original Morse code, and was based on a code used on Hamburg Railways Jerk, 1848. A common code was a necessary step to allow direct telegraph connection between countries. With different codes, additional operators were required to translate and retransmit the message. In 1865, a conference in Paris adopted Jerk's Code as the International Morse Code and was henceforth the international standard. The U.S., however, continued to use American Morse Code internally for some time, hence international messages required retransmission in both directions. Topic. Expansion As well as the rapid expansion of the use of the telegraphs along the railways, they soon spread into the field of mass communication with the instruments being installed in post offices. The era of mass personal communication had begun. Telegraph networks were expensive to build, but financing was readily available, especially from London bankers. By 1852, national systems were in operation in major countries. Although many countries had telegraph networks, there was no worldwide interconnection. Message by post was still the primary means of communication to countries outside Europe. Topic: Telegraphic improvements. A continuing goal in telegraphy was to reduce the cost per message by reducing hand work or increasing the sending rate. There were many experiments with moving pointers, and various electrical encodings. However, most systems were too complicated and unreliable. A successful expedient to reduce the cost per message was the development of telegraphies. 
The first system that didn't require skilled technicians to operate, was Charles Wheatstone's ABC system in 1840 where the letters of the alphabet were arranged around a clock face, and the signal caused a needle to indicate the letter. This early system required the receiver to be present in real time to record the message and it reached speeds of up to 15 words a minute. In 1846, Alexander Bain patented a chemical telegraph in Edinburgh. The signal current moved an iron pen across a moving paper tape soaked in a mixture of ammonium nitrate and potassium ferrocyanide, decomposing the chemical and producing readable blue marks in Morse code. The speed of the printing telegraph was 1,000 words per hour, but messages still required translation into English by live copyists. Chemical telegraphy came to an end in the U.S. in 1851, when the Morse Group defeated the Bain patent in the U.S. District Court, for a brief period, starting with the New York-Boston Line in 1848, some telegraph networks began to employ sound operators, who were trained to understand Morse code orally. Gradually, the use of sound operators eliminated the need for telegraph receivers to include register and tape. Instead, the receiving instrument was developed into a sounder, an electromagnet that was energized by a current and attracted a small iron lever. When the sounding key was opened or closed, the sounder lever struck an anvil. The Morse operator distinguished a dot and a dash by the short or long interval between the two clicks. The message was then written out in long hand. Royal Earl House developed and patented a letter printing telegraph system in 1846, which employed an alphabetic keyboard for the transmitter and automatically printed the letters on paper at the receiver, and followed this up with a steam powered version in 1852. Advocates of printing telegraphy said it would eliminate Morse operators' errors. The house machine was used on four main American telegraph lines by 1852. The speed of the house machine was announced as 2,600 words an hour. David Edward Hughes invented the printing telegraph in 1855. It used a keyboard of 26 keys for the alphabet and a spinning type wheel that determined the letter being transmitted by the length of time that had elapsed since the previous transmission. The system allowed for automatic recording on the receiving end. The system was very stable and accurate and became accepted around the world. The next improvement was the Bado Code of 1874. French engineer Émile Bado patented a printing telegraph in which the signals were translated automatically into typographic characters. Each character was assigned a 5-bit code, mechanically interpreted from the state of 5 on off switches. Operators had to maintain a steady rhythm, and the usual speed of operation was 30 words per minute. By this point, reception had been automated, but the speed and accuracy of the transmission was still limited to the skill of the human operator. The first practical automated system was patented by Charles Wheatstone, the original inventor of the telegraph. The message in Morse code was typed onto a piece of perforated tape using a keyboard-like device called the stick punch. The transmitter automatically ran the tape through and transmitted the message at the then exceptionally high speed of 70 words per minute. Topic: <laughs> Teleprinters. An early successful teleprinter was invented by Frederick G. Creed. In Glasgow he created his first keyboard perforator, which used compressed air to punch the holes. He also created a reperforator and a printer. 
The reperforator punched incoming Morse signals onto paper tape and the printer decoded this tape to produce alphanumeric characters on plain paper. This was the origin of the Creed high-speed automatic printing system, which could run at an unprecedented 200 words per minute. His system was adopted by the Daily Mail for daily transmission of the newspaper contents. With the invention of the teletypewriter, telegraphic encoding became fully automated. Early teletypewriters used the IDA-1 Bado code, a 5-bit code. This yielded only 32 codes, so it was overdefined into two shifts letters and figures an explicit unshared shift code prefaced each set of letters and figures in 1901 Bado's code was modified by Donald Murray by the 1930s teleprinters were being produced by teletype in the US Creed in Britain and Siemens in Germany by 1935, message routing was the last great barrier to full automation. Large telegraphy providers began to develop systems that used telephone-like rotary dialing to connect teletypewriters. These machines were called Telex, Telegraph Exchange. Telex machines first performed rotary telephone-style pulse dialing for circuit switching, and then sent data by ITA-2. This Type A Telex routing functionally automated message routing. The first wide coverage Telex network was implemented in Germany during the 1930s as a network used to communicate within the government. At the rate of 45.45, plus or minus 0.5%, boo. Considered speedy at the time. Up to 25 telex channels could share a single long-distance telephone channel by using voice frequency telegraphy multiplexing, making telex the least expensive method of reliable long-distance communication. Automatic teleprinter exchange service was introduced into Canada by CPR Telegraphs and CN Telegraph in July 1957 and in 1958, Western Union started to build a telex network in the United States. The Harmonic Telegraph The most expensive aspect of a telegraph system was the installation, the laying of the wire, which was often very long. The costs would be better covered by finding a way to send more than one message at a time through the single wire, thus increasing revenue per wire. Early devices included the duplex and the quadruplex which allowed, respectively, one or two telegraph transmissions in each direction. However, an even greater number of channels was desired on the busiest lines. In the latter half of the 1800s, several inventors worked towards creating a method for doing just that, including Charles Borsell, Thomas Edison, Elisha Gray, and Alexander Graham Bell. One approach was to have resonators of several different frequencies act as carriers of a modulated on-off signal. This was the harmonic telegraph, a form of frequency division multiplexing. These various frequencies, referred to as harmonics, could then be combined into one complex signal and sent down the single wire. On the receiving end, the frequencies would be separated with a matching set of resonators. With a set of frequencies being carried down a single wire, it was realized that the human voice itself could be transmitted electrically through the wire. 
This effort led to the invention of the telephone, while the work toward packing multiple telegraph signals onto one wire led to telephony. Later advances would pack multiple voice signals onto one wire by increasing the bandwidth by modulating frequencies much higher than human hearing. Eventually the bandwidth was widened much further by using laser light signals sent through fiber optic cables. Fiber optic transmission can carry 25,000 telephone signals simultaneously down a single fiber. Topic: <laughs> Oceanic telegraph cables. Soon after the first successful telegraph systems were operational, the possibility of transmitting messages across the sea by way of submarine communications cables was first proposed. One of the primary technical challenges was to sufficiently insulate the submarine cable to prevent the current from leaking out into the water. In 1842, a Scottish surgeon William Montgomery introduced gutta percha, the adhesive juice of the Palachium gutta tree, to Europe. Michael Faraday and Wheatstone soon discovered the merits of gutta percha as an insulator, and in 1845, the latter suggested that it should be employed to cover the wire which was proposed to be laid from Dover to Calais. It was tried on a wire laid across the Rhine between Dutes and Cologne. In 1849, C. V. Walker, electrician to the South Eastern Railway, submerged a two-mile wire coated with gutta percha off the coast from Folkestone, which was tested successfully. John Watkins Brett, an engineer from Bristol, sought and obtained permission from Louis Philippe in 1847 to establish telegraph graphic communication between France and England. The first undersea cable was laid in 1850, connecting the two countries and was followed by connections to Ireland and the Low Countries. The Atlantic Telegraph Company was formed in London in 1856 to undertake to construct a commercial telegraph cable across the Atlantic Ocean. It was successfully completed on 18 July 1866 by the ship SS Great Eastern, captained by Sir James Anderson after many mishaps along the way. Earlier transatlantic submarine cables installations were attempted in 1857, 1858 and 1865. The 1857 cable only operated intermittently for a few days or weeks before it failed. The study of underwater telegraph cables accelerated interest in mathematical analysis of very long transmission lines. The telegraph lines from Britain to India were connected in 1870, those several companies combined to form the Eastern Telegraph Company in 1872. Australia was first linked to the rest of the world in October 1872 by a submarine telegraph cable at Darwin. This brought news reportage from the rest of the world. The telegraph across the Pacific was completed in 1902, finally encircling the world. From the 1850s until well into the 20th century, British submarine cable systems dominated the world system. This was set out as a formal strategic goal, which became known as the All Red Line. In 1896, there were 30 cable-laying ships in the world and 24 of them were owned by British companies. In 1892, British companies owned and operated two-thirds of the world's cables and by 1923, their share was still 42.7%. Topic cable and Wireless Company Cable and Wireless was a British telecommunications company that traced its origins back to the 1860s, with Sir John Pender as the founder, although the name was only adopted in 1934. 
It was formed from successive mergers including The Falmouth, Malta, Gibraltar Telegraph Company The British Indian Submarine Telegraph Company The Marseille, Algiers and Malta Telegraph Company The Eastern Telegraph Company the Eastern Extension Australasia and China Telegraph Company The Eastern and Associated Telegraph Companies Topic Telegraphy in War Before the American Civil War the telegraph systems were primarily used in the commercial sector the government buildings weren't connected to each other via telegraph lines, but instead relied on runners to carry messages back and forth between buildings and offices. Before the war the government saw no need to connect lines within city limits, however, they did see the use in connections between cities. With Washington, D.C. being the hub of the American government, it had the most connections, but it only had a few lines running north and south out of the city. It wasn't until the Civil War broke out that the government saw the true potential of the telegraph system. Soon after the shelling of Fort Sumter, the South cut telegraph lines running into D.C. This put the city in a state of panic for they feared an immediate southern invasion, due to its large and robust telegraph system, as well as its industrial base. The North had a large advantage over the South during the course of the war. Within six months of the war breaking out, the U.S. Military Telegraph Corps USMT had laid approximately 300 miles of line. By war's end they laid approximately 15,000 miles of cable, 8,000 for military and 5,000 for commercial, and had handled approximately 6.5 million messages. The telegraph was not only important for communication within the armed forces, but also in the civilian sector, helping political leaders to maintain control over their districts. Even before the war, the American Telegraph Company censored suspect messages informally to block aid to the secession movement. During the war, Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, and later Edwin Stanton, wanted control over the telegraph lines to maintain the flow of information. Early in the war, one of Stanton's first acts of Secretary of War, was to move telegraph lines from ending at McClellan's headquarters to ending at the War Department. Even Stanton himself said, Telegraph is my right arm. Many northern victories were found due to the use of the telegraph. Victories include the Battle of Antietam, 1862, the Battle of Chickamauga, 1863, and Sherman's March, 1865. The telegraph system wasn't without its flaws. The USMT, while the main source of telegraphers and cable, was still a civilian agency. Most operators were first hired by the telegraph companies and then contracted out to the War Department. This created tension between generals and their operators. One source of irritation was that USMT operators didn't have to follow military authority, they usually performed without hesitation, but they didn't have to. To remedy this problem Albert Maya created a U.S. Army Signal Corps in February 1863. As the new head of the Signal Corps, Maya tried to push all telegraph and flag signaling under his command, and therefore subject to military discipline. After creating the Signal Corps, Maya pushed to further develop new telegraph systems. While the USMT relied primarily on civilian lines and operators, the Signal Corps' new field telegraph could be deployed and dismantled faster than USMT's system. During World War I, 
Britain's telegraph communications were almost completely uninterrupted, while it was able to quickly cut Germany's cables worldwide. British access to transatlantic cables and its codebreaking expertise led to the Zimmermann telegram incident that contributed to the US joining the war. World War II revived the cable war of 1914 to 1918. In 1939, German-owned cables across the Atlantic were cut once again, and, in 1940, Italian cables to South America and Spain were cut in retaliation for Italian action against two of the five British cables linking Gibraltar and Malta. Electra House, Cable and Wireless's head office and central cable station, was damaged by German bombing in 1941. Topic end of the telegraph era in America The end of the telegraph era can be associated with the fall of the Western Union Telegraph Company. Western Union was the leading telegraph provider for America and was seen as the best competition for the National Bell Telephone Company. Western Union and Bell were both invested in telegraphy and telephone technology. Western Union's decision to allow Bell to gain the advantage in telephone technology was the result of Western Union's upper management's failure to foresee the surpassing of the telephone over the, at the time, dominant telegraph system. Western Union soon lost the legal battle for the rights to their telephone copyrights. This led to Western Union agreeing to a lesser position in the telephone competition, which in turn led to the lessening of the telegraph. While the telegraph was not the focus of the legal battles that occurred around 1878, the companies that were affected by the effects of the battle were the main powers of telegraphy at the time. Western Union thought that the agreement of 1878 would solidify telegraphs as the long-range communication of choice. However, due to the underestimates of telegraphs' future and poor contracts, Western Union found itself declining. AT&T acquired working control of Western Union in 1909 but relinquished it in 1914 under threat of antitrust action. AT&T bought Western Union's electronic mail and telex businesses in 1990. India's state-owned telecom company, BSNL, ended its telegraph service on 14 July 2013. It was reportedly the world's last existing true electric telegraph system. Topic see also 92 Code Aurora Astronomy, Geomagnetically Induced Current Great Northern Telegraph Company Harrison Gray Dyer, who supposedly erected the first telegraph line and dispatched the first telegram neutral direct current telegraph system submarine communications cable Western Electric Company Wireless Telegraphy American Telephone and Telegraph Company AT&T Bell Canada Guglielmo Marconi Marconi Wireless Company